Good afternoon and evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Tom Aloya, VP of the Oncology Service Line for Ascension Healthcare, and uh, one of the uh, Oncology MIS leads um, within SAGES. Along with um, Vivian Strong and John Marks, we welcome you to the continuation of uh, a really unique uh, multi-specialty and multi-society sponsored webinar series on patient-centric surgery in the 21st century, improving cancer care delivery through minimally invasive surgery webinar series. Our topic today is improving the care of pancreatic cancer patients, discussing the current status and strategies for today and tomorrow. The uh, lead moderators of this panel are Dr. Adnan al Saidi and Dr. Melissa Hogg, and I will be introducing them and they'll take over for the rest of the session. We're very pleased to have you join us. We had almost 800 pre-registrants for this uh, webinar, so um, really attest to the strength of the multi-society platform, which we feel is really innovative and we're glad you're with us. On the next slide, um, we will show you the upcoming attractions. Um, the rest of the series um, will go through liver, esophagus, adrenal, hypac, and thyroid. Um, please note those um, dates. You can also click the link at the top of the page to register and have your calendar automatically update. As well, you can um, shoot uh, through your uh, smartphone the scan me uh, QR code in the right side of the screen and that will take you to the sign up page as well. That having been said, I'll introduce um, our two moderators uh, for tonight. Um, Dr. Melissa Hogg um, is the Director of HPV Surgery at North Shore University Hospital and Director of Advanced Robotic Training for the Granger Center for Simulation and Innovation. Uh, she returns to Chicago now, having done her medical school and residency training at Northwestern University, her fellowship and master's uh, in medical education and clinical research were done at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, where she also had her first faculty appointment. She is currently on the faculty of the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine and serves as associate program director of the General Surgery Residency and Complex General Surgical Oncology Fellowship. She's joined tonight moderating with Dr. Adnan al Saidi, who is Professor of Clinical Surgery and Vice Chair for Education in the Department of Surgery at UCSF in San Francisco. Dr. al Saidi has extensive experience with minimally invasive and open hepatobiliary pancreatic and endocrine surgeries. Additionally, he is interested in expanding surgical therapies for patients with locally advanced pancreas cancer, splenic preservation techniques, and immunology studies. He too has a bit of a homecoming as he was a graduate of the UC Santa Barbara and then Pennsylvania State University Medical School. He completed general surgery residency at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And following that served as a surgeon in the US Navy and as co-director of the surgery department at the US Naval Hospital in Okinawa, Japan. Dr. El Sadi completed an HPV and advanced GI fellowship at Wash U in St. Louis and earned a master's degree in surgical education at Southern Illinois University and the University of Illinois UC. So I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Melissa Hogg to introduce the first set of uh, speakers for this exciting panel. Thank you, Thank you again for joining. All right, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, thank uh, Dr. Aloya for those uh, great introductions. Um, and I'd like to start off by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Mary Dilhoff. Uh, she is a surgical oncologist graduate from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Fellowship and is now at the Ohio State University. And I think I speak for everyone where we love surgery and surgical oncology 
at the Ohio State, but maybe not college football, but that is just in my opinion. Um, so without further ado, she will be kicking off our pancreas cancer discussion tonight, uh, talking about screening and molecular diagnostic advances in pancreatic surgery. So please take it away, uh, Dr. Jill Hoff. All right, unmuted. It only took me a whole year to um, get to that. So one second. All right, everybody have um, slides now. Um, so Dr. Haug, thank you. Um, thank the whole um, society and team for um, having um, inviting me to speak. I'm very honored to spend time with you this evening. Um, I'm going to talk about, like Dr. Hood said, molecular diagnostic advances um, in pancreas cancer. I have no disclosures. Um, and so, as all of you know, many of you know me. And um, presentation yeah. mode. Um, I am in presentation mode. Are you seeing it now? Um, I'm looking at presentation mode. One more second. Let me try it one more time. Do you have du dual screen, May? No, but let me on. Uh, I'm going to unshare for one second and then um, redo it. Thanks. Of course, it worked two seconds ago. Well, um... all right, I got it. Coming at you. Now, better? Beautiful. Perfect. All right, now we're in action. Sorry, I, like a year and a half of Zoom and still I'm um, not um, an expert, clearly. Um, so uh, as many of you know, I um, obviously enjoy um, robotic surgery and that's what the topic is um, tonight um, and like to talk about robotic surgery, but we're gonna take that um, to an even smaller level and talk about um, advances on the molecular level. And uh, this is a short talk, so in 15 minutes, I can't talk about um, any, uh, you know, all the advances on the molecular level in depth, but I'm going to introduce some things that are newer and that we might see up, um, coming over the next many years to our practices. So um, we'll introduce them as just a, a little bit to pique your interest in um, things that we can go, you know, in, um, look into further um, and more in depth. So I'll split these into endoscopic advances. We'll talk about molecular testing of, um, and cystic lesions of the pancreas, um, some imaging advancements using needle-based confocal laser endomicroscopy, um, molecular profiling in pancreas cancer, and then circulating tumor cells. Uh, the um, overall um, introduction to pancreas cancer, I'm sure we don't have to belabor in that the overall survival from panc for pancreas cancer for all comers remains less than 10%. Uh, and the risk of dying uh, from pancreas cancer currently in the United States, it's the fourth most common cause of cancer death. And predicted by 2030, it's expected to be the second most common cancer death in the United States. So um, we clearly have the need to make advances in the way we care for these patients. In endoscopic advances, we'll start there. And we'll, so we'll talk about the cyst fluid molecular analysis and endoscopic um, ultrasound guided needle-based confocal laser endomicroscopy. The use of cis fluid CEA has obviously been the most common um, diagnostic test that we use when trying to diagnose a cystic lesion of the pancreas. And we all know it's um, not that sensitive or, sensitive or specific. So we definitely have some need for some better markers for diagnosis and for markers of risk. Um, so next generation sequencing has been used, and there's a nice paper um, in gut in 2018 by the Pittsburgh group. And when using um, KRAS or GNAS, GNAS mutations, it's very sensitive and specific to diagnose IPMNs. So 100% in their study of IPMNs had either a KRAS or GNAS mutation. The marker was not as accurate for MCNs as only 30% of them had a KRAS or GNAS mutation. And when looking at the less common serous adenomas and solid pseudopapillary tumors, uh, serous adenomas had VHL mutations in some of them and CTN and B1 mutations in, in solid pseudopapillaries. Those were in small numbers. And so those need um, a little bit more examination across bigger studies. Um, they did have some markers that were more associated with advanced dysplasia, so um, high grade dysplasia or cancers. And those markers like P53, PIK3CA, P10, and the 
others listed um, were more likely to be associated with more advanced um, lesions. So this is an important uh, advance in our, not only our diagnosis, but our prediction of um, risk for these patients that have cystic lesions. So when we look at this, that um, using KRAS and or GNAS in, um, in the cyst fluid, it's 100% sensitive and 96% specific. So a very good test, obviously. Um, compare that to our traditional um, elevated CEA that's 57% or 70%. Um, clearly this test um, um, using KRAS or GNAS was better. Um, other things like using the presence of multiple cysts or increased fluid viscosity also um, don't have great sensitivities and specificities. There's been more recent um, looking at other fluids like cis fluid glucose, um, and that was shown to be better in some studies um, compared to cis fluid CEA. So there's lots on the horizon as far as our diagnostic abilities um, in IPMNs. Um, the, there's many challenges though still. Um, handling the biospecimens is costly and sometimes difficult. There can still be some insurance um, coverage problems um, for these patients. Um, it's still not available at all academic centers or, or commercial laboratories. Our hospital currently does this in-house, but um, for several years we didn't do it in-house and really had a lot of issues with, um, with the cost that patients were getting um, passed on. Um, there's obviously increased costs when using these commercial laboratories. And these these, um, this data still needs multi-center um, real-world confirmation. So still work to be done, but some really interesting um, findings that I think will become um, much more common, you know, in the, in the next uh, many years. Uh, as far as um, endoscopic um, advances, um, as far as imaging goes, um, the use of um, needle-based confocal laser endomicroscopy, it's a real-time endoscopy guided microscopy, microscopy that facilitates in vivo characterization of his histopathology. Mm. So here's the setup. Um, this is um, uh, from one of my uh, gastroenterology colleagues, Dr. Krishna, who's really been a pioneer in this field. And so the setup, you basically have a tower with the computer and the NCLE probe gets loaded on a 19 gauge needle, which can be put through an um, a US scope. And here's video here. You can see the um, needle um, going through the cyst lesion. And then the bottom right corner is the view you get um, from the NCLE probe. And those thick papilla are what's diagnostic of an IPMN. And so this work is really interesting coming on from several institutions. And um, Dr. Krishna has done some really interesting work looking at the depth of those papilla and those that are greater than 50 micrometer or 50 microns are more associated with dysplasia. So this has been a really interesting study. This is not um, standard of care across the United States. This is routinely done um, by, our, um, by our gastroenterology group for our patients undergoing EUS. Um, so moving on topics um, to molecular profiling. Uh, sh so who should we test? Um, should we test all of our patients is often a question. We can make it very short for a short talk and just say yes, but uh, we'll, um, we'll elaborate a little bit in that um, the NCC and guidelines recommended um, germline testing for all pancreas cancer patients starting with the 2019 guidelines. Um, and the reason is um, if you look across studies, there's about between 10 and 25% of patients will have um, uh, actionable mutations when tested. And when you um, selectively test patients, so select patients that you that are young or you think are otherwise high risk for a genetic mutation, it's predicted that you'd miss about 40% of those that have mutations that we could act on. And so that's why the recommendations came to test all patients. Uh, the genomic landscape over the last 10 years has become pretty well characterized um, with KRAS, P53, CDKN 2A and SMAD4 mutations being the most common. There are multiple others that occur in less frequency. Um, this is paper out of Memorial that was published last year. And in general, this paper and other papers um, in general um, have the wild type tumors uh, in general have a better overall survival than the patients that have the other mutations, KRAS and, and others. Um, as far as actionable mutations go, uh, for pancreas cancer, it's still relatively few when you compare this cancer to some others that um, some other cancers that have you know many actionable mutations. But there are some that are important for our patients, and that germline mutations um, in BRCA one and two, we know those patients have improved outcomes with platinum-based therapies and PARP inhibitors. There are TRK inhibitors for patients that have NTRK one, two, and three mutations. And for our patients with mis, um, mismatch repair deficient tumors or MSI high tumors, we have immune checkpoint inhibitors. 
So this list is growing, obviously, over the years in practice, we see this growing, and I expect over the years that this will, um, this will become many more. The Know You Tumor data bank was an interesting um, look at um, uh, patients that got that matched drug to their mutation. This was published in Lancet last year as well. And they looked at over a, a thousand uh, pancreas cancer patients that had genetic testing. And for those patients that had an actionable mutation that then got the drug that was matched to their mutation had a um, much uh, had an increased overall survival than those patients that didn't get the matched drug or that didn't have an actionable mutation, as you can see in the survival curve here. And this also worked in second line therapy. So for those patients that got first line therapy and progressed and then went on to second line therapy, again, if they got that matched drug, they had a much better survival than their um, unmatched counterparts or patients that didn't have a genetic um, actionable mutation. And um, kind of our last big topic, let's um, look at circulating tumor cells. Um, circulating tumor cells are identified in the blood and are prognostic interest in multiple malignancies. Um, it is, um, just really being um, looked at more in pancreas cancer. So pancreas cancer isn't kind of the, at the forefront of uh, others. It's looked at more in breast cancer and colon cancer. There are multiple commercial tests that are available. There's um, many um, companies that do this test, Cell Search, Foundation One, CDX, and Signatera. Um, so you, it's a pretty simple test. You send blood to this, um, you know, out to this lab and they'll give um, uh, whether circulating tumor cells um, are present or not. Um, this study was uh, just published at the end of last year in Nature, and it was a small study. And so you can see that the overall survival was not statistically significant, although it probably has a trend towards being significant and that if patients that have um, negative circulating tumor cells in their blood um, had a 48.6% um, for survival versus 14.6. But when looking at their risk of systemic recurrence, it, um, they had a much higher risk of systemic recurrence when they have circulating tumor cells in the blood. And you can see in that graph on the right, a 70% versus 29.4%. And so um, this, given that um, how simple the test is and what we're finding in other malignancies, I think this is likely to become um, more relevant to us in, in surveillance, especially. So overall, um, multiple molecular advances um, are, have occurred in the past, you know, 10 years from cystic lesions of the pancreas to pancreas cancer. Um, guidelines recommend currently that we should gen um, get genetic testing profiling for all pancreas cancer patients. And I think some of these newer advances are really going to become standard of care. So I could easily see that molecular profiling of cystic lesions be standard of care for, our, you know, across the country, as well as monitoring circulating tumor cells for cancer recurrence. Um, and it, since it's MIS, uh, I'll take one second to shamelessly plug um, uh, robotic Whipple um, program building. And part of it is I got to give um, Dr. Hogue and Dr. Martini um, some credit for um, teaching me and my group how to do this, how to do robotic Whipples. And so um, with them and the help of Dr. Zay and um, um, Zeracat, we learned and started our program several years ago. And um, this is a paper that my partner wrote about our learning curve. And we were very um, systematic and thoughtful about our approach and um, in just in creating a program that was um, successful and safe. And we um, showed that in our learning curve that our times after the first 10 really um, leveled out and our complications when matched to our open cases were, were similar in all, in all categories. And so I think with um, the other speakers are going to talk about this much more, but um, I think probably a lot of people are on here because they have some interest in MIS. And I think that um, with the help that's out there in the country currently and the skills of other surgeons that we can really um, help everyone learn to do this safely and in a thoughtful way. So that's my, my shameful or shameless plug for robotic surgery. Um, I appreciate your attention. Thank you for coming this evening. Uh, if there's any other questions, we can answer them during the, um, during the question and answer period at the end. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Dilhoff. That was an excellent um, uh, talk uh, on a sort of w wide gamut of different things. And uh, please, uh, we'll um, have our questions at the end. Um, the next speaker, I think, um, needs no grand introduction. Um, it's uh, Dr. Matthew Katz from MD Anderson, who's a professor at the Department of Surgical Oncology. And for those of you tuned in, uh, thinking he was going to talk about borderline resectable clinical trials. Uh, he will actually be talking about the status of where we are today 
with MIS Adoption and he's traveling. So we have a video uh, that's recorded and hopefully he'll be able to uh, join us at the panel. But I was able to uh, visit MD Anderson a year or so ago when they were just starting out the program. And he's been such an amazing mentor to a lot of uh, young talented surgeons that have uh, the MIS bug for sure. So without further ado, I think uh, they'll take away the video present today and I apologize uh, that I have to do this uh, recorded. I'm, I'm currently driving across the country and I was afraid I wouldn't uh, make the, uh, the meeting. Uh, but at any rate, um, today I'm going to talk about uh, where we are uh, with adoption of uh, minimally invasive pancreatic surgery. And I want to give credit to uh, Dr. Naru Akoma, who is my uh, partner in the pancreatic surgery service. Uh, most of this work is his, most of these slides are his. Uh, and uh, I'm going to give my perspective as the as the chief of the service uh, in how we're kind of developing uh, our uh, program. Uh, but but uh, but um, you know most of this most of this stuff is his. Um, so so um, and let me move my head. Uh, in full disclosure, I'm not a minimally invasive pancreatic surgeon, but I do fully support its use uh, as part of our pancreatic surgery program. So I have three objectives. Um, the first is to review potential issues and obstacles specific to the use of minimally invasive surgery for pancreatic neoplasms. The second is to review selected high-level data on MIS pancreatectomy. And the third is to describe our approach uh, to programmatic development in this area at MD Anderson. So minimally invasive and robotic surgery um, has many benefits uh, with respect to laparoscopic surgery, of course, small incisions, less pain, less opioid use, uh, potentially less post ileus and quicker recovery. Um, with respect to robotic surgery, all of those advantages plus uh, magnified 3D vision and improved surgical skills with uh, wrist, wrist, artic, uh, wrist articulation. But um, those benefits may or may not translate to improved outcomes for patients with cancer. And this, in fact, was a, a caution uh, issued by the FDA uh, with respect to the use of robotic surgery uh, for cancer operations. Uh, and they state here, the relative benefits and risks of surgery using robotic assisted surgical devices compared to conventional surgical approaches and cancer treatment have not been established. So what are the data uh, regarding MIS surgery uh, for cancer? And, and they're mixed essentially. On the top, um, several uh, studies in the rectal cancer space. Uh, there have been three large randomized control trials which showed equivalent outcomes uh, when comparing minimally invasive to open rectal resection, but there were two uh, very high profile RCTs which failed to show non-inferiority of a laparoscopic approach. The third was conducted uh, through the ACASOG uh, and the second uh, was the a la carte study. And in both of those studies, non-inferiority of the laparoscopic approach uh, could not be demonstrated. Uh, with respect to cervical cancer, and these are data out of our, my, our own institution, uh, there was um, actually inferior survival uh, among patients who underwent laparoscopic uh, uh, versus open radical hysterectomy for early stage disease. With respect to pancreatic cancer, uh, there, are another, there are several other issues we need to consider. The pancreas is retroperitoneal and intimately associated with blood vessels. There's invasion often into adjacent structures, mandating on block resection. Surgical margins are extraordinarily critical. Surgical reconstruction is complex. And of course, even localized pancreatic cancer is systemic in essentially all patients. So surgical technology is not the whole story. And really tumor anatomy and cancer biology are really the drivers of outcomes after pancreatic surgery. So what are the data uh, for minimally invasive surgery for pancreatectomy uh, for neoplasms? Uh, these are data for distal pancreatectomy and in general, uh, the data support the use of distal pancreatectomy using a minimally invasive approach. Uh, the top uh, um, 
illustrates uh, data from the Leopard trial. This was a Dutch uh, multi-center randomized control trial that was open in 14 centers. Most of the minimally invasive operations were laparoscopic. There were very few robotic pancreatectomies, but the long story short was that there was shorter time to functional recovery in the minimally invasive group. On the bottom, the diploma study, this was an observational minimally invasive versus open distal pancreatectomy for cancer study in which again, most of the operations were done uh, laparoscopically, very few were done with the robot. Um, again, this was a retrospective cohort study that demonstrated uh, equivalent safety outcomes, but higher R0 resection rates uh, using a minimally invasive approach. The overall survival was actually equivalent between open and minimally invasive groups and uh, lymph node retrieval was actually lower in, in the laparoscopic group. Um, but uh, together these generally paint a picture of, um, of uh, uh, favorable outcomes that are able to be achieved using minimally invasive surgery for distal pancreatic tumors. For uh, pancreatoduodenectomy, the data are not quite so uh, robust. There were two small trials uh, comparing minimally invasive to uh, open pancreatoduodenectomy, uh, one done in Spain and one done in India. Uh, but really the most compelling data come from the Leopard trial. This was a uh, Leopard 2 trial. This was a study done in the Netherlands, um, which uh, was really a large randomized control trial comparing laparoscopic to minimally invasive pancreatoduodenectomy. There was some element of quality control in this study in that um, surgeons who accrued to this study had to have previously performed 20 laparoscopic procedures. But at the end of the day, uh, this study uh, terminated early uh, after accrual of only 99 patients when it was found that the mortality rate in the laparoscopic arm was, uh, was extraordinarily high, 10%. Um, so those data are mostly, as I said, uh, laparoscopic data. With respect to uh, robotic pancreatoduodenectomy, there are no randomized control trials. There are uh, retrospective studies from select centers, such as, of course, uh, Pittsburgh. Um, and um, uh, the data from, from uh, these studies uh, show um, that... Uh, um, Robotic pancreatoduodenectomy is associated with an over, uh, a longer operative time, reduced blood loss, and a reduction in major uh, uh, mort uh, morbidity uh, with equivalent uh, uh, metrics in all other regards, uh, mortality, pancreatic fistula, length of stay, et cetera. It's important to note that all the patients in these, uh, in this, uh, in these uh, studies uh, were essentially uh, uh, operated on following completion of the learning curve by the uh, accruing surgeon. And this is important because the learning curve is not uh, insignificant. Essentially, these data from uh, Pittsburgh show that it takes 80 uh, robotic pancreatoduodenectomies to become uh, really expert at the procedure. But after uh, completion of these 80 cases, mortality is reasonably low, pancreatic fistula rates are low, conversion rates are low, and uh, margin negative resection rates are quite high. Um, that um, uh, um, uh, learning curve needs to be kept in mind because while the numbers of cases uh, of robotic operations are increasing and have increased steadily uh, between 2010 and 2016, uh, as these data uh, clearly show, most centers that can uh, perform these operations perform less than one operation uh, a year for both uh, pancreatoduodenectomy robotically and distal pancreatectomy robotically. So again, here that uh, uh, these two graphs show on the left distal pancreatectomy and on the right pancreatoduodenectomy, the number of centers increases, the number of cases increases, the percentage of robotic cases relative to the total number of cases increase. But at the end of the day, most centers are doing very few uh, operations. So with all this in mind, what are the advantages of uh, building a robotic surgery program? Well, there are many, uh, and those include marketing, uh, they draw new patients, 
they uh, add to the bottom line. Uh, they improve uh, uh, they, their sources of research and, and improve education. And they largely uh, appear to uh, translate to improved patient satisfaction. So with respect to uh, pancreatic programs, uh, I do believe it is important that uh, robotics be a part, a minimally invasive surgery and robotics be a part of, of those programs. So how have we built our program and what are some strategies? And I think these are really the three uh, take home points here. First, you gotta figure out a way to get over the learning curve because 80 pancreatic resections is a lot of pancreatic resections. Number two, you have to emphasize the oncologic principles and, and adhere to them. And number three, you have to mandate safety and transparency. So here's how we've uh, overcome the learning curve at MD Anderson. We have basically combined our robotic pancreatectomy program with our robotic gastric surgery program. And, and Dr. Ikoma uh, leads uh, these programs. And Dr. Ikoma's practice is essentially gastric surgery and pancreatic surgery. And um, doing both of these operations, which um, clearly overlap to a significant degree, has allowed him to increase his uh, technical expertise in a relatively short amount of time. And he's created a uh, video here that show uh, several of the shared steps between robotic pancreatoduodenectomy and robotic uh, gastric surgery. Um, and I won't belabor them, but I do think uh, it's important to highlight some of these shared steps, which include, of course, entering the lesser sac. This is done in both of those operations, gastrectomy and uh, pancreatoduodenectomy, and all of these uh, techniques uh, are the same. Um, certainly, the uh, hepatic artery lymph node dissection and the, and the dissection uh, of all of the major mesenteric vasculature is very similar uh, between these procedures. Uh, and then, um, of course, all of the um, all of the reconstruction. Uh, uh, you know, you learn how to do one reconstruction, and and those are very similar between um, between gastrectomy and pancreatoduodenectomy. Um, and here, Dr. Akoma Demon, you know, really highlights the point that you know the hepaticojejunostomy utilizes many of the same skills as does esophago esophago. Uh, jejunostomy that's required in a um, in a gastrectomy. The second thing that's important to recognize is that you have to uh, emphasize the oncologic principles. And so some of the principles uh, for pancreatic surgery include um, dissection, a periadventitial dissection of the superior mesenteric artery, so as to include all of the tissue between the uncinate process and the artery, and a complete lymphadenectomy. And we did a study many years ago through the ACASOG and showed that, you know, most of the time these techniques are not being performed even in open operations. So it's doubly important to emphasize these techniques when, um, when performing these cases minimally invasive or robotically. We do a periadventitial dissection of the SMA open by retracting the superior mesenteric vein uh, to the patient's left. And, and Dr. Akoma has been able to recapitulate this exact technique um, you know, robotically, here's another one of his uh, videos. Um, that uh, highlights the technique. He, he, he uses vessel loops, vessel loops, uh, places those around the superior mesenteric vein, uh, retracts the superior mesenteric vein with these vessel loops using a extracorporeal approach that allows excellent visualization of the superior mesenteric artery and the superior mesenteric artery dissection can be conducted exactly as it is conducted uh, in the uh, open approach. Here he is getting fancy with uh, fluorescent angiography, uh, but you know, you don't need fluorescent angiography for most cases. What you do need is uh, complete visualization um, by retraction of the vein and uh, this can be done using, uh, using this type of technique and uh, here he, here he goes, um, you know, with the superior mesenteric artery dissection, uh, getting out the IPDAs, et cetera. Um, it is important to highlight the oncologic uh, 
principles, particularly if you're operating at a um, at a uh, academic center. And we highlight, uh, we make the fellows uh, draw out all of the anatomy uh, that they will encounter um, uh, you, in a minimally invasive operation prior to the operation. We do this for both open and uh, minimally invasive operations so that they can really plan out the operation in their head prior to uh, uh, getting on the console. And the, the final thing I think is really important is promoting and insisting really on safety and accountability. And we have a uh, prospective uh, system at our center to detect, grade, and report all adverse events. We've reported on this, uh, on this uh, system before. It's a prospective 90-day system that's run by one of our nurse practitioners. And we um, get all data relating to adverse events. We um, then distribute those data every few months to each surgeon. Um, on the bottom, you can see my data if you're really interested. These are open operations for the most part because I don't do a lot of minimally invasive operations. But we track, the point is that we track all of the adverse events that each of us encounter and compare those adverse events to those of our group in order to identify um, opportunities for improvement and we take this system very seriously and I think that if you really want to develop a, a minimally invasive program or really a pancreatectomy program the right way you got to do this sort of thing. Um, here are Dr. Acoma's uh, outcomes over the past uh, uh, two and a half year period 194 gut uh, minimally invasive uh, four gut cases primarily uh, pancreas uh, gastric also liver I should note uh, our colleague, Dr. Hop Tran Kao, who does our minimally invasive uh, liver uh, operations for the most part with really good results. And, and again, we've had our program up and running for about two and a half years. Um, and uh, already I think he's done an outstanding job um, with, with the support of, uh, uh, of, um, of the entire pancreatic surgery service. So to summarize, um, I think there are unique oncologic and technical issues that exist with respect to the use of minimally invasive surgery for, for pancreatectomy. Um, the data to support minimally invasive pancreatectomy, particularly for pancreatoduodenectomy, are not, uh, are not cut and dry. Uh, but there are, I think, pretty clear advantages to offering a minimally invasive uh, surgery program as part of a pancreatic surgery, a comprehensive pancreatic surgery service. In order to develop such a program, accelerate progress through the learning curve, emphasize the oncologic principles, and grow safely and transparently. And I've shown you how we've done that um, uh, uh, so far at MD Anderson. So thanks again uh, for uh, inviting me. Hopefully I'm here for the uh, question and answer period. I apologize that this was not live. I'm somewhere uh, between Syracuse, New York and Rochester, New York. Um, uh, but uh, appreciate it. And uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Acoma for letting me uh, steal some of his material. Thanks so much. Well, thank you for that wonderful um, presentation. Hopefully, uh, Dr. Katz will be able to join us later on during the panel session. Um, I do see we already have one Q&A, so I'd like to reach out to the audience to continue to, uh, to uh, post questions that we can talk to at the end of the, at the, end of the ha uh, last half hour. Um, and without further ado, we'll uh, move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Alice Wei, um, who is co-director of Surgical Initi uh, Initiatives at the um, David M. Rubenstein Center for Pancreatic Cancer Research. She's also Associate Professor of Surgery at uh, the Weill Cornell School of Medicine. Uh, she's also a fellow HPV heroine, and she gives us a little bit more of an international flair as she was um, a, um, on staff at uh, University of Toronto in Canada uh, before joining the staff um, at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering a couple years back. Uh, and we are lucky to have her talking uh, with us today about the hurdles of MIS adoption. So please take it away. Thank you. So uh, just can you guys see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. And um, actually, the timing is perfect following Matt, because I think that he presented a lot of the data. Uh, and really, I'm going to focus not just on the data, but really how to get started, what to do with the data so that these are my disclosures. Um, what we know about minimally invasive pancreatectomy is that it does 
it is um, having some adoption and we can see here, this is the Nesquip data from, uh, from July, 2019 to, to June, 2020. So very, the newest data that's available. And you can see across 115 hospitals that participate in Nesquip Collaborative, which everyone is familiar with. It's a quality assurance program as part of the American College of Surgeons that, that the uptake of pancreatectomy uh, continues to increase, particularly for distal pancreatectomy. So you see now that about half of the cases, just under half are done open, and that the breakdown, uh, more than half now are done minimally invasively, of which the breakdown is 30% laparoscopic and 20% robotic. And you know, a few years ago in the 2014, 20 uh, uh, data, a little bit before that really, really, there has been a big shift in the last few years. Even with Whipple procedures, although that's still dominated by open procedures, over 90% are done um, an open approach that we do see that the minimally invasive approach does continue to grow and that the mix here is a little bit more robotic. So almost 8% are done robotically and only 3% are done laparoscopically. So this is kind of the current landscape of what's being done in uh, North America uh, um, and that uh, this is a nice study that was, uh, was done uh, by Chuck Fulmer's group where they did a global survey looking um, at about just under 800 surgeons and uh, asked them what their use of distal pancreatectomy uh, was and how many of them used MIS approach. And you can see that as a group that, um, that there was only about just under 20% that never used MIS approach. And if you look in North America, we actually were doing fairly well that for, the, for uh, distal pancreatectomies that over 60% uh, did it at least sometimes, if not frequently or always. And this compares favorably to other parts of the world, uh, particularly in um, Europe and uh, where really we're seeing many more uh, open cases and, and the slower adoption of MIS technology. So um, Horatio is gonna be speaking at the end of today they, uh, and, and also a multi um, society panel, including many of the members here, the EHPBA, the IHPBA, the AHPBA, the Asia Pacific HPBA, SSO, SAGES, and, uh, all came together and, uh, and had the Miami International Evidence-Based Guidelines looking at minimally invasive resection. And as a group, they did literature searches on the key questions to see what the evidence was out there and, then, and, and developed expert recommendations in terms of the current state of the art for what is, um, uh, what, how we should be guided in terms of minimally invasive surgery. And so that we can see that for distal pancreatectomy, that the minimally invasive distal pancreatectomy and, uh, and uh, when they did this was really for benign and low grade malignancy should be considered the standard of care open over open distal pancreatectomies because it was associated with the shorter hospital stay, uh, blood loss and equivalent complication rates. And I won't go into the randomized trials that populated this because Matt just talked about it in his previous talk and also some uh, rel uh, relatively large or medium sized uh, cohort studies populated this recommendation. Certainly the data for Whipples is much less clear. There is, not, uh, there is only the laparoscopic trial, LEPR2 trial that was of course, Matt talked about was closed due to um, uh, a signal of uh, safety, but certainly there are some trials underway now looking at um, uh, uh, primarily robotic assisted uh, pancreatic glucodrogenectomy and large cohort studies of which Melissa uh, and the Pittsburgh team have uh, uh, published as well as large um, Asian studies looking at that it does appear to be safe, but certainly the data is not as clear as it is uh, for a distal pancreatectomy and neither, uh, none of the uh, minimally invasive data sets for um, pancreas are as clear as other things like uh, such as uh, colorectal. So certainly we can still benefit from higher quality trials in the area, but it does seem like there is adoption of it and there's some recommendation, uh, moderate recommendation that this, um, that we can proceed with minimally invasive adoption. So in terms of how do you get started here, I assume that many of the participants um, on this call are either doing minimally invasive pancreatectomy or are interested in doing it. Um, and how do you get over that hurdle and what are the hurdles for it? Certainly, and many of you have seen this already, this is a Rogers diffusion um, of innovation model and this came out in the early 60s and that, uh, that 
This really is for many uh, technologies, whether it's hybrid cars, whether it's going to space, whether it's minimally invasive surgery, you can see that there is this model where there are innovators uh, uh, that are really developing at the very beginning and really uh, wrestling through some of the uh, nuts and bolts of it. Uh, then there are early adopters. And I would say then there's this big chasm here where for whatever reason, although this um, shows uh, promise, it is hard to implement to any kind of uh, innovation into the greater uh, um, uh, routine clinical practice. I, I can say really optimistically that for distal pancreatectomy, I think we're beyond these phases and we're certainly well into the early uh, majority, if not almost tipping over into the late majority phase. So those of you there um, on this call who are not yet doing minimally invasive distal pancreatectomy, I think the time is nigh and there's a lot of opportunity to learn that. I can tell you that for uh, pancreatic go do adenectomy, I would say we're beyond the innovator phase, we're really in the early adopter phase. And I, and I have great optimism that we have leapt already the chasm and we are really in the beginning of the early majority phase. Because I think some of the constraints initially of this, uh, of doing uh, Whipple procedures and a minimally invasive approach have been solved. Some of the solutions are available. So, for those of you out there who would like to set up a program, I think that what's very important is that you be mindful about it um, and that you put together an explicit plan to make it work. Um, you need to get training uh, and that means that you either have, and that includes being well-trained to do the open uh, pancreatectomy and having been over your learning curve for open uh, pancreatectomy and then getting the additional training that can be different whether or not you're a junior attending, whether you're a trainee, whether you're a senior attending for the next steps. You need to assemble a team because the team is not just you, the surgeon who wants to do it, but includes uh, your colleagues as well as uh, nursing and anesthesia to make sure that it's successful and also sustainable. So, you know, one person isn't a program. A program is when this, it can be sustaining whether you're there or not. You have to make sure that you have the right equipment, uh, which uh, can be uh, very in itself. And then you have to make sure that not only do you choose the right patients, but that you also have the right volume of appropriate patients to make this program a success. And then as Matt said in his uh, study, uh, in his talk just a moment ago, that you need to explicitly set and achieve milestones. And if you're not achieving the milestones and you need to reassess where you're at to ensure that there aren't uh, things that need to be corrected along the way, course corrected or adjustments to make your program more successful. And you need to monitor your outcomes. So similar to what they do at MD Anderson at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, we follow our, all of our outcomes very rigorously. And as well, programs like NISQIP allow many um, hospitals to be able to continue to monitor their programs. But you also have to uh, dedicate time to uh, monitoring and reviewing uh, the outcomes. In terms of training, I, I do think there are many paths to skill acquisition. Uh, you know, in this way, in, uh, I think a decade ago, when we were all trying to train ourselves how to do minimally invasive liver surgery, uh, and then uh, the early days of distal pancreatectomies, we really thought that maybe everyone needed to have all their HBV, all their MIS, be double trained in everything in order to be able to do it uh, and be an expert open surgeon before, taller, before doing, tackling anything else. What we see now is that younger trainees that come out, they have a lot more exposure to minimally invasive techniques. Many of them will have exposures to uh, a moderate amount of robotic techniques as well. So that you know the capacity of the training, uh, there's a lot more capacity and there's a lot more uh, uh, training that's done at the resident level. So the fellows that come and then the junior attendings that come um, coming on board have more baseline minimally invasive training than we ever did. For training the surgeons who are already in practice, so that is most of you on this call, continuing medical education is surprisingly hard. I would say that there are many opportunities and different models for doing this. There's one-on-one -on -one proctorships that you, can, that you can take advantage of. And some of those proctorships, you should look around maybe in your own hospital. There are formal observerships where you can go to another institution and, um, and observe what they're doing in order to learn uh, te some techniques, as well as there's didactic courses, some are offered by industry, some offered by societies uh, that will, can, can help enrich your, uh, your training. And there's also some former mentorship courses where they're in, and I'll talk about them in a minute, where you really can uh, learn in a 
formalized curriculum um, at, before you initiate your own program. So this is one uh, example of a formal program, and this is the LELAPS training experience in the Netherlands. Uh, and this was a, uh, it, it actually, there was LELAPS one, two, and three. The first one was in order to, di uh, to disseminate rapidly uh, the technique of laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy in the Netherlands, which has a uh, centralized system for high volume centers doing pancreatic surgery. LELAPS 2 then evolved into laparoscopic Whipple procedures, and then LELAPS 3 uh, is now fit, working on robotic uh, Whipple procedure. And the LELAPS 2 and the LELAPS 1 were really foundational programs in order to uh, train surgeons for leopard 1, leopard 2 trials. And what these uh, programs have in common is that there's three components. And this is something you may be able to reproduce in your own center. Uh, they include a detailed uh, technique description where somebody uh, goes through all of the elements of the technique, including tips and tricks. There's video training where you watch uh, how a straightforward uh, operation is done and, um, and, that, uh, and when it's uh, not so straightforward and how to get yourself out of trouble and identify issues. And there's on-site proctoring for when you do your first few cases, and that includes an expert surgeon, not from your center to provide guidance. For when they looked at the LELAPS program, it took about eight hours to uh, complete all of the elements. And this really allowed, and you can see this nice visual abstract uh, uh, from the publication uh, looking at LELAPS uh, uh, that showed that it really allowed safe dissemination of MIS for distal pancreatectomies from 90% to 47% in about a, just over a, a year's time, a, a, like a couple years time in total, that there was no difference in complication. In fact, you can see numerically they de uh, that was a little bit less and there was decreased length of stay. So they were able to rapidly disseminate MIS to an entire population of patients um, in a safe uh, way in a very rapid sequence. And this has been um, then um, shared into a, a larger program called LearnBot, which is really a European initiative for robotic distal pancreatectomy, really drawn on this program. So we don't have this in North America, but certainly we can model ourselves or you can model your own pro a program to look, up, uh, to look like that. So I'll, I'll, in terms of assembling a team, I think you should be very explicit about it and name exactly who they are. It doesn't have to be every single person on the service. And sometimes the most senior surgeons, uh, 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 like Matt says, uh, they may not need to do MIS surgery, but they certainly need to support it. I would suggest that you need at least two identified surgeons who are going to be interested and work together. They can provide insight and guidance to each other about each case, patient selection, anatomy, and oncologic issues. And that uh, we have committed to doing when we did, you know, we for the first 20 cases together, so we each can get to our learning curve more quickly. Uh, we also, the other people that are at part of your team are the other MIS surgeons at your own institution that can provide a lot of insight about what we already have in terms of uh, uh, equipment, what kind of techniques they're learning that you, they can share with you. They can teach you techniques that are either new to you or update your techniques. And they can provide also peer mentorship as well. And they're also readily available in-house. Your OR team needs to be experienced, including your anesthetists. Uh, we have dedicated robotic PAs, and they are just absolutely essential at making things run smoothly. They also have a knowledge of advanced instrumentation that you may or not be aware of because other groups in your own hospital may be able to use it. And so they're a valuable resource. And at the beginning, if your PAs are not available for that case, you should move the case to a time when they're available so that we can all share in the experience and learning together uh, more quickly. Uh, in terms of instrumentation, I'm probably running a bit short in time. Recording so recording progress. Progress. Everyone, everyone, so just in terms of equipment, uh, you need to like take an inventory of what you have. You know, whether or not you do laparoscopy or robotics has more to do with uh, sort of what your system and the context of where you are than what you may want yourself. A hospital is not going to buy a robotic system for just the HPV program, but they so you have to make the case that, it, that the, uh, you, the rest of your institution will also use it as well. And if that's not to be the case, instead of not doing MIS, you might consider doing laparoscopy. So certainly you have to share in, the, uh, in what's available and what's realistic for your center. If you're not doing robotics, then it's important to think about the optical systems. The 3D system is excellent for robotic, uh, particularly robotic livers, but also very important for robotic uh, distal pancreatectomy. The ease of use is very nice. 
And then also you have to go through a checklist about which kind of transection devices, which kind of hemostasis devices, what kind of advanced instruments do you need to have in terms of bulldogs, et cetera, other things to be able to do what you want safely. Then the next step is to select the appropriate cases and I'm just gonna list them there, anatomy, exposure, oncologic concerns, can you get clear margins, can you localize what you need to, any particularly safety consideration and whether or not you need to do anything concomitant with them. I will tell you the one thing though, is if you wait for the perfect case, you might wait forever. So it's a real balance about finding the best, the safest case to do that's appropriate. But, uh, but, if, you, but practice, if you wait for the perfect one, it may be challenging to come by or be, and you may have a hard time uh, um, completing your learning curve. So just to keep that in mind. And then you have to set explicit milestones. So you have to, the, the milestones should include things. How many cases are you gonna do in, and what's your volume gonna look like in the first year? Graduate from easy to hard cases. If you always do easy cases, you're not really growing or building a program. If you only do difficult cases, you may not get off the ground, okay? The learning curve was discussed earlier. You need to be aware of that and work with the learning curve and be at the right place with the right cases for where you're on the learning curve. And you have to follow important metrics and I'm just listing the OR efficiency metrics and oncologic measures, explicitly measured. And then you have to monitor your performance. So. It's not good enough to say, I'm gonna do it, here I am, I'm on my own program, now I'm doing it. You really have to monitor, uh, you have to performance manage yourself, schedule regular intervals to review where you're at, review, so make sure to celebrate when things go well, learn from failures, uh, try not to make excuses. If things aren't growing, try to fix them so they can grow. And so if it's not working, you have to look, do I need more training? Do I need more equipment or different equipment? Do I need to change up the team members? And just remember, you shouldn't be doing the same thing on the first case as the 150th case. Your technique will evolve as you grow through your learning curve. So just expect that continuous improvement and continuous learning. So you need to be able to plan, execute, review, identify opportunities to change and improve, and then continue that cycle again. And so anybody who knows me knows I love horses. So just to point out this night's nice Canadian, Eric Lamaze won an individual gold in show jumping. All of you guys are ready to jump the hurdle. This is the checklist you need. You have to get the training. Do I have I assembled a team? Do I have the right stuff? You have to choose the appropriate patient, set your milestones, plan and monitor, but you have to hit the start button at some time. So you have to jump the chasm and go to the next step. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Wei. That was really, really well said. Very good. Thank you so much. That's. Um, I want to remind everywhere this is Adnan Al Saidi. I'm one of the co-moderators. Uh, to please uh, uh, ask questions in the Q and A. I'm going to ask the panelists, uh, Dr. Wei, if you can unshare. That way, Dr. Martini can share, and then I'll ask the panelists to answer some of the questions in the Q and A as we uh, have two more speakers, and then we'll go on to a, a full panel Q, Q and A at that time. Uh, so the next, I have the pleasure and the honor to introduce uh, uh, really uh, Dr. Uh, John Martini, who needs no introduction and is really a close friend and an expert surgeon. Um, Dr. Martini is a uh, current surgeon at Atrium Health in the Carolinas. Uh, he did his uh, medical school at Penn State, then went to Brown for residency, and then I did, did an HPB uh, and transplant fellowship uh, in McGill. And if you don't think a uh, transplant surgeon can do uh, MIS surgeon, uh, Dr. Martini is the exact uh, uh, proof that that can happen. So uh, he's gonna talk to us about technical comparison and pearls of MIS uh, for pancreatic uh, cancer, talking about laparoscopic and robotic, and it's an honor to have him here today. So thank you, John, please. You're welcome. Well, thank you for the <clears throat> invitation to present. And, and John, please uh, turn on your video if you don't mind, sorry. Uh, it, I, I'm sharing, so tell me. No, your your personal video, not the. Uh... Oh, my personal. Yeah, start my video. Yeah, I tried to do. There that. you go. There Excellent. You go. Thank you. All right, good. So, um, uh, as I uh, mentioned, uh, um, I've been asked to talk about some of the technical comparisons and pearls um, uh, for this uh, session. I do have some disclosures, which I would. Uh, uh, present including work for that I do for intuitive as well as teaching for Ethicon and Medtronic. So I do a lot of teaching, a lot of training, uh, which was discussed uh, on the previous talk. 
Uh, I've got 20 minutes. Uh, I, I'll start with a cautionary note about the adoption of MIS techniques in the setting of cancer. Um, I'll talk about the evolution of different techniques, uh, in, in particular distal and Whipple. Uh, and uh, this is not meant to be a comprehensive uh, how-to talk. So that usually takes me two or three hours to get through an, an actual step-by-step -step talk. And I'll talk about some of the emerging oncologic data that, that hasn't been presented. I think uh, I had the good fortune of uh, working a little bit with Blake Cady when I was at Brown. Uh, and this is his famous quote that biology is king and case selection is queen. Uh, but certainly there, are, there is importance to um, the uh, technical outcomes. Um, and th this would be my quote, you know, any possible long-term benefit to patients who are undergoing an MIS uh, procedure for, for pancreatic cancer, whether this is laparoscopic or robotic, and either Whipple or distal pancreatectomy are easily negated by sloppy technique or inferior short-term outcomes. What that means basically is you, if you don't do an operation well, you're not doing your patient who has pancreatic cancer any favors at all. And I think we all need to remember that. Um, this uh, Leopard 2 trial was already discussed. I'll tell you that um, my own personal opinion is this is a randomized trial of people who were at the very beginning of their learning curve. Uh, with all respect to some of the surgeons who are very well known, uh, all of, most of them had less than 20 uh, or around 20 uh, laparoscopic procedures. So distal pancreatectomy, I'm going to start with this. You know, when we started or I started uh, doing these procedures uh, about 16, 17 years ago, we were doing all kinds of different things, laparoscopic. Some of these were hand assisted and it, I had the good fortune of starting to do some of these robotically. Um, there was a variety of techniques, and at the time, um, some of the techniques uh, were, I would say, substandard. We were doing uh, a, a lot of the uh, non-cancer procedures were done with something called a Warshaw technique, which is essentially where the splenic vessels are sacrificed, but the spleen is preserved off the short gastrics. And that's an operation which I have not done in over 10 years now because we evolved our technique away from that towards something more sophisticated, that is with either with vessel preservation uh, or for a more radical operation. You know, I also started the uh, technique uh, that was taught to me by people like Horacio and uh, Mike Kendrick and other people where we did this. The patients were with the left side up, uh, right lateral to cubitus. We used this clockwise approach starting lateral to medial. And over time, I drifted away from that technique where I started, when I started doing more uh, uh, cancer operations, where we actually started a medial working our way from the celiac axis towards the lateral, which is much more uh, consistent with an oncologic procedure. And so this, this evolution took time. You know, back in 2006, this was on a standards, the, the very first generation robot where we would actually measure the, the port distances. We would put patients in lateral position. The um, uh, patients were, um, uh, you know, uh, this report placement. And this would be, you know, a typical uh, operation. You know, we would dissect, uh, open the lesser sac and uh, mobilize the panc pancreas from the retroperitoneum. Of course, primitive as it was, we were still using laparoscopic ultrasound for this is a robotic procedure. Dissecting the splenic artery and we had heavily dependence on endovascular staplers. Point of fact, you know, endovascular staplers really facilitated the adoption of, of MIS to liver and pancreas procedures. But you can see here, this is, this is for a pseudopapillary tumor. But you can see we're dividing the pancreas not near the celiac axis. We're out in the body of the pancreas. And this would be what I would call um, you know, version 1.0. And again, using staplers, using clips. And then the pancreas would be stapled again out in the splenic hilum. And that's, that's what was called or what is called a Warshaw technique. We don't do those anymore. Um, early limitations included limited instrumentations, limited tools. We didn't have the robotic vessel sealer. We didn't have the robotic stapler. Uh, there was limited ergonomics. Uh, and my own skills at that time were still uh, in their uh, uh, 
uh, beginning phase. That is, I was still learning how to do uh, things like robotics and uh, laparoscopic surgery and had limited knowledge. So I would say early on, we had conver probably a 30% conversion in our minimally invasive distal panks, whether that was lap or uh, robotic. And a lot of those uh, was the uh, use of hand ports. But with time, you know, uh, we got better and uh, matured the techniques and refined the techniques. And uh, at one point in my career, uh, probably uh, 2010 or so, uh, I converted all of my laparoscopic cases became robotic cases. And, and there were a lot of different reasons for that. As I mentioned, we abandoned the Warshaw procedure. We increasingly performed a, vat, a vessel preserving technique for, for appropriate indications, which obviously would be inappropriate for a cancer. Uh, and we radicalized the procedure for the for uh, pancreatic cancer and the left pancreas. And when I say radicalize, I'm going to show that video next. But we also, at the same time as we got better, we eliminated the use of hand ports. We eliminated uh, conversions uh, almost completely. But this is an interesting slide. This is uh, operative time and distal pancreatectomy. And you could say, wow, John, you're really not ever getting better. Well, it wasn't that I wasn't getting better. What it was, was we started doing more and more complicated cases. And we also started using a distal pancreatectomy as the, the, the principal teaching platform for residents and fellows. So that is all my, all the HPV fellows, essentially they would do um, a majority of the distal pancreatectomies. This is a you know, recent shot of what port placement looks for a robotic distal pancreatectomy. We have five ports. And this is what it looks like. And I'm gonna to skip to the, the interesting part. So we start patients are supine. Our target is the celiac axis, opening the lesser sac. This is actually a patient who had a T4 pancreas cancer growing into the back of the stomach, posterior wall stomach, received uh, three months of neoadjuvant fulfirinox. So we've encircled the stomach here. And this is where I try to get as radical as possible for cancer. So this is the station eight lymph node. This is hepatic artery lymph node. You can see this is where I start my operations for a distal pancreatectomy. So we're mobilizing, we mobilize this uh, um, hepatic artery lymph node, predominantly using these uh, scissors. And we're, once we identify the hepatic artery, we will dissect backwards towards the celiac axis taking all the lymph nodes with us. I think it's really important. If you're talking about doing a cancer operation for a left pancreas, this is what you need to be doing. Dissect all of these lymph nodes down. You're gonna, we're gonna dissect out. There's the, you can see the left gastric or coronary vein. And then that's, this is the root uh, underneath the hepatic artery where the portal vein emerges from the neck of the pancreas. This is, this is a radical operation. Once the uh, splenic artery is encircled, we then um, go to the inferior border of the pancreas. We identify the uh, uh, tunnel where the superior mesenteric vein is, and that's dissected out. Umbilical tape is passed. And once that's done, we're ready to take the neck of the pancreas. So at this point, we'll go ahead and staple. We're going to use the uh, this is a robotic stapler. I, I will say um, it, it does have a little bit of, uh, there are some subtleties which are, are maybe lost on beginners and, and you have to learn how to use this stapler on thick pancreases. Uh, we then will immediately, for sake of efficiency, we'll go ahead and staple the stomach that was attached to the tumor. And then we're done with staplers. We then, Next sequence would be to take the splenic vein followed by the splenic artery. And I like to do it the old fashioned way. So I'll ligate the, the uh, splenic artery with silk ties and then locking plastic clips. And would say that I've used thousands of these clips over the last 16 years uh, on all kinds of uh, vessels, very safe vessels. Then when you move out towards the, the tumor in the body, you need to stay radical. You need to stay deep. A lot of times we'll actually get into the uh, into dorotus fascia and the renal fascia and staying outside. Sometimes the adrenal gland has to be resected. But this is this is what I mean when when I say this is a radical, this is a cancer operation. This is the way I do or in the past would have done an open operation. 
So this is what you want to do. Okay. Some of the data from our center uh, comparing a comparative series lap and robotic, you can see here fairly good in terms of operative time, maybe a little longer on the robotic time, but certainly uh, does well uh, in terms of splenic preservation when indicated, and then conversion rates is actually better in the robotic arm. Um, we also looked at specifically at left cancer uh, operations uh, and looking at robotic versus a laparoscopic. Uh, this is over about a five year period. But look at the interesting thing here is if you look at the lymph, lymph node harvest, it's significantly higher in the robotic arm for exactly what I just demonstrated. Um, and uh, the um, all things being equal complications and everything are, are about the same fistulas. Um, the other uh, part of this is we have a slightly higher R0 rate with the ro robot. Uh, and this translated at least into our series, although it was underpowered into a, a longer median survival and a longer time to recurrence. So you are starting to see some glimmer that there may be a benefit oncologically to doing something with the robot if your outcomes are good. So Whipple procedure which has been discussed already. You know, these are long, complex cases. There's a very long learning curve, uh, which I think some people underappreciate. Uh, as you saw in the Leopard 2 trial, they had five deaths in 46 patients. That's a lot of deaths in, in, in that number of patients. And I think you really, it's really important to have mastered a Whipple, know how to do that operation, be trained how to do that operation. But I don't know that you necessarily need to have done these uh, Whipples laparoscopically. There's, there's really uh, a, an argument against that. I do think that um, you do have to have sufficient volume in order to do these procedures. Uh, this is not an operation that should be done in a center that says uh, does like three or four Whipples a year. It's probably not appropriate. I will say, you know, I started robotics in 2006. It took me six years to build up my robotic skills and my open Whipple skills in order to feel confident enough to do what I, what I do robotically. And uh, my goal was to replicate our open technique. Uh, also in full disclosure, I've never done a laparoscopic Whipple. But you can see this slide is our, our data from Carolinas. I didn't start doing Whipples until, you know, after about six years, seven years of doing robotics. And so you have to take your time. And as you get better and your tools get better, uh, this is where you get. So this is port placement for Whipple, uh, five ports. We have one assistant 12 millimeter port, which serves for staplers and suction and, and sutures. Uh, and we'll actually put the robot stapler there if we need to. Um, again, my goal or our goal at Carolinas was to match our open technique as much as possible. I did not want to cut corners. Uh, all, all attendings at our hospital, both open and robot, do a traversal Longmire technique. Uh, we do a two-layer hand-sewn end-side PJ, a single-layer HJ, and a single-layer hand-sewn DJ, which is typically anticholic. Okay, um, so we replicate, robotically wanted to replicate what we do open. Some of the finer points, which I think are the critical, the critical steps of a Whipple include, this is the uncinate dissection. Um, I think uh, people struggle with, uh, you know, how to do this, how do you see it, you know, how do you attack this, and you really need to, especially this is a patient who has a big fat uncinant process, you know, really thick, you need to do this, and no one's shown yet, ultrasound, you have to do ultrasound in order to identify your superior mesenteric artery, and then you start to come through your uncinant process in a layer by layer by layer. I will say that I don't always do a periadventitial dissection unless my tumor is located in the uncinate. So if I have a tumor that's up in the head or it's a cholangio or something, I'm not right on the adventitia of the SMA. I don't think that's necessary. And it can lead to higher complications and bleeding. So you can see this is a kind of a, a sticky pancreas. We're gonna have to um, be very careful as we dissect into the groove here, into this uh, uncinate. You can see if you get into bleeding, okay, what do you do now? You don't panic, you don't open. You need to be able to control the bleeding. You get a suture. This is a 5-0 monocryl on an RB1 suture. We're just gonna stitch this up real quick, take care of it, and that avoids a conversion. When I first started, this would be a, 
no doubt a conversion. But now, if, once you learn how to handle this stuff, you take care of it. And the next thing you should do is ask yourself, okay, was that, was that the SMA or was that an inferior pancreatic branch? And that's what you do. Ultrasound, find out where your tumor is. You find out where the inferior pancreatic artery is. It's right there on color flow ultrasound. Everyone should be doing ultrasound. So you get your retraction back. You finish doing this posterior dissection of the uncin at the posterior layers. And once you get into this area, you find there's the artery. It's right in that package of, of uh, lymphatic tissue and a clip goes on. And that is how to safely do an uncinate process uh, in my, the way I do it. If I, again, if I have an, if I have a tumor that's, gonna, that's in the uncinate, I'm gonna get in a deeper plane right on the adventition. How about the reconstruction? Okay, this is the other critical part because if you have, uh, you know, a technique isn't good on the PGA, you're gonna have a lot more leaks and leaks are gonna lead to inferior outcomes. So this is, you know, this is an older uh, reconstruction of probably from about five or six years ago, but this is how we do it still. It's a single layer. It's a running suture on the posterior capsule. You can see this is a soft pancreas with a two millimeter pancreatic duct. Suffice it to say, I could never do that laparoscopically. And then this is how it's done. This is done with a 6-0 monofilament suture. And it's, it's, it's really clear to me, there's a handful of surgeons in the, in the world who can do this laparoscopically, one of who's gonna be speaking right after me uh, and uh, who's an amazing surgeon. But I would, I would argue that most surgeons are not technically capable of doing this uh, laparoscopically. And I'll be the first one to raise my hand. And that's what it is. Similar is an HJ. So anybody can, everyone says they, oh, I can do a laparoscopic hepaticojejunostomy. But this is a five millimeter bile duct. And this is on, you know, a, doing a Whipple on an, on an OR nurse. In no doubt, if I was doing this laparoscopically, I would either stricture the duct or have a leak. And so this has to be done with interrupted monofilament sutures. I'm gonna skip over the next slide. So this is what robot Whipples uh, look like postoperatively. That's an optimal uh, um, uh, figure. Uh, we looked at our, um, we always always uh, track all of our data. We looked at our experience. We've, we've done now about 200 uh, robotic Whipples, but we looked at a, a series of, propen this is a published uh, propensity match study matching 38 open with 38 robotic uh, cancers, T stage for T stage, matching them for neoadjuvant therapy uh, and, and, and things like that. You can look at this operative uh, details, uh, uh, pretty good in terms of operative time. The remark, this is remarkable. If you look at the lymph node yield for robotics, it's actually higher than our open lymph node yield. Now you could say one of two things, either we're not doing an adequate lymphadenectomy open or we're not, or we're doing a really good job robotically. One of, you take your pick. But if we look at other things, this just like the distal pank, if you look at median overall survival in the robotic arm, we actually have a higher uh, median survival and uh, time to recurrence, similar to the, the left pancreatectomy data. Now it's underpowered, and uh, so it's type two error. But you and you could say, what is that? Is it selection? Well, I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, case selection is very important, as is disease biology to good have good outcomes, and good techniques are critical if there are to be any gain in the short term outcomes. And both whether you're talking about lap or robotic, uh, if you combine good techniques and outcomes, uh, then you may have improvement in oncologic outcomes. And I think that we're probably gonna to start to see that as, as many centers start to get more and more experience and better outcomes. Uh, so the final uh, word of advice to the next generation, obviously attitude really is everything. If I could uh, go back in time and, and convince myself to start doing uh, a little bit more uh, robotics or, or laparoscopic early on, I think I would be in a better place. But remember, safety and proper training is critical to success and is really important uh, in taking this on. And so with that, I'm gonna stop. I hope I haven't gone over with time. Uh, I think I'm about 20 minutes now. Um, that was wonderful. Thank yeah, you so much. I will stop. So.
That was perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, Dr. Martini. That was awesome. Thank you, guys. So uh, we, we, uh, we're going to have plenty of time for a question and answer. Again, for those who have asked uh, questions in the Q&A, we'll ask them to the panel uh, to uh, allow uh, uh, more than one person to, to reply. But please keep asking questions. Our next speaker and our last speaker uh, for this evening uh, requires really no introduction. He's the past president, the immediate past president for SAGES, and that's Dr. Hiroshi Asbin. Um, He'll be talking to us about uh, horizons for minimally invasive pancreas cancer. Uh, he's currently the chief of uh, hepatopancreatic uh, biliary surgery at Miami Cancer Institute. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have him always uh, and speaking to us here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations for putting this um, webinar together. Um, as you can see, the prior speakers have been done a tremendous job. Um, and uh, I, I really appreciate Dr. Martini for your, your comments. Um, I, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit of a potpourri here, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the trends in uh, pancreatic surgical oncology. Um, uh, and uh, uh, some are techniques in minimum invasive, but the other ones are for interventional radiology. Then uh, um, these are my disclosures, but there should be no conflicts with this presentation. Um, I just want to say, though, a little bit of like, um, like Dr. De Martini said, we need to remember that uh, uh, the the techniques that we do are just a small part. We all have to decide that the multi-specialty approach is the best one, and for this, uh, you need to remember the surgeon is no longer the only one that makes a decision to operate or not operate. It should be a multidisciplinary approach, and uh, and the next thing is MIS surgery is no longer new. You know, there is no question. I mean, as I, as I was, somebody asked me at a, at a meeting over the weekend, when, when did I do my first laparoscopic Whipple? And uh, it's over 20 years. It's, it, uh, it was in 2001, then it's over 20 years ago. Then uh, let's talk about other novel therapies too, and hopefully I'm gonna be able to talk about that today. Um, in terms of what we do, we have been starting to use some uh, fluorescence in pancreas surgery, and it's not a big deal. This is not related to cancer, but it's interesting. We don't have it down yet because of the timing, but there are some things that are very helpful, especially when the pancreatic parenchyma doesn't have chronic pancreatitis. Uh, for example, in this case, we're doing the ancinate process. And you can see here, this is when we inject the, the, in those, the fluorescence and we're gonna see as the IPDA here lighting up. This is pancreatic parenchyma from a prior injection. Then this is the arterial and you can confirm this is the IPDA, this is the vein. I'm sorry, this is the SMA and this is the vein. Then the SMA here and the IPDA, they light up at the same place. And I agree with Dr. Demartini, this is how you have to do the, the ancinate process pretty clearly um, uh, delineated and close to the vessels to be able to do an oncologic dissection. Then you clip the arterial part and then you go a little bit further. And now we're at a minute and the arteries are clean See, you don't see it on the arteries, it's gonna be cleaning up a little bit more and the, the contrast is gonna to go to the vein. Then you continue the dissection. And in this case, you can see the pancreatic parenchyma exactly where it is. Unfortunately, this is not reproducible when you have chronic pancreatitis or a fibrotic pancreas. And, and it depends also about the timing of all of this. And this is what we're studying. What is the timing? How can we do it? And we're doing, um, uh, pretty interesting pilot uh, studies that are helping us to do that. On another case, this is a pancreas preserving total duodenectomy. And this is for ampullary adenoma. This is a patient with a clear ampullary adenoma that it was um, uh, felt to be benign, but it's growing into common bile duct. Then we divide the duodenum proximally. This is the staple the, of the duodenum proximally. Uh, just after the pylorus, this is pancreas. This is a procedure that we have developed laparoscopically and we do it routinely. And now using inflorescence also helps us see where is the pancreatic parenchyma here. And we continue the dissection and you can see how we gradually separate this is pancreas from the duodenum. And you continue to look going down. I'm just gonna fast forward because we're all running a little late. And we continue now on the third and fourth portion of the duodenum. We go back a little bit more, little by little. This is the third and fourth portion. And now we're getting to the area of where the bile duct should enter the duodenum. This is duodenum. And we see two different 
what we think is two different diets. This is pancreas. This is, and then we see, is this a, a duct? No, this is the duct because we see the, the immunofluorescence going, pancreas, duodenum, and this is the duct. Then this technique allows us better than an ampullectomy to get a better margin when the ampullary tumor is growing in, into, the, into the bile duct. Then we cut here the, the bile duct and you're gonna see that we can confirm how the, the immunofluorescence comes down and, uh, and just divides, you, you starts to come in there. We don't, and then that's the bile coming out. And we're gonna divide the other one. And that's a very small duct. It's around a, 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 a two millimeter duct over here. And that was just a vessel. Then we stop the bleeding of the vessel. We put that just sometimes it's better not to cauterize anything even for the bile duct. And now you can see here that is the bile duct and that, that's the bile duct and this is the pancreatic duct. And then we do an anastomosis. We, do, we create a septum between the bile duct and the pancreatic duct. And as Dr. Demartini has shown, it's similar technique, very clear visualization of each stage. Here is the pancreatic duct, this is the anterior layer and I'm not gonna bore you with the rest. This is our timing and the dosages, but again, this is in, in progress, this is in study. Um, then hopefully we're gonna be able to give a little better, um, a better idea of how to immunize in pancreatic surgery. IRE is not new, and uh, I was not too much of a fan of IRE until I arrived to my new institution, MCI, where we have a gentleman that's Narayanan, who has done in 2009 and has done it percutaneously. Um, he, traditionally, before I came here, we have to do it with an open procedure, but he does it percutaneously, and we all know what it is. It's not rely on thermal-based coagulative necrosis, but on high voltage, a maximum of 3,000 voltage, and, uh, and given in length and pulses. It does induce permanent cell membrane porosity, which leads to permanent cell death uh, with collagen structure de 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 destruction. And it's usually used for palliative um, cases, sometimes for margin accentuation. Then um, the ideal patient for percutaneous IRE is an unresectable stage three. If it is metastatic, it is not used. And uh, it has completed at least one line of chemotherapy and the size should be less than three centimeters. This is uh, one of the cases of percutaneous IRE. We don't need to do surgery on these patients and we have pretty good results. This is pre-IRE, post-IRE, and the, the PET scan shows pretty clear uh, death and the, the, of the tumor. And this is three months, this is a month later, and this is three months later. This is palliative, but I've been humbled by the results of um, my colleague, Dr. Narayanan, who is an uh, interventional oncologist here at Miami Cancer Institute, and he does a great job. This is a great tool to have. Um, this is 18 months follow-up, no evidence of local recurrence. Eventually they will recur, but at least um, there, is, there is a good result. On 50 patients, a series that he has done on 50 patients, uh, median overall survival of 25 months, 27 months, um, and uh, uh, 14 months of, from IRE, and this 27 months from diagnosis. Then a median survival for unresectable pancreatic cancers of 14.2 months, it's pretty decent without any question. And this is the Louisville that is, you know, Dr. Rob Martin is the one that has published this for many years. And this is open. And this is the Miami experience, pretty similar with percutaneous. Then um, the average overall survival is more or less the same, 25 versus 27 months, meaning we're avoiding a surgery on this patient. Again, the surgeon is no longer the only one treating this type of disease. MR Linux, MRI Linux has been something that um, also, it's at my institution where I have been incredibly impressed. It's basically uh, uses MRI instead of CT to give radiation. And uh, the, this is the only radiation machine in the world to, to image continuously during treatment. And the tumor is tracked during the treatment. Then this is not a CT image that is a steady, that, that is a single one and everything is planned with markers, etc but this is actual tumor tract during treatment. No fiduciary markers are needed. This is, for example, one of the cases. Uh, you see the tumor is in green and the patient is breathing. When it goes in, then the beam is on, starts to get out, the beam is off. Again, on, 
and then off. What it means is because it's so precise, they can give a much higher dose of radiation because there's not going to be any radiation out of this and there's not gonna be radiation when this is moving. This is also important from the point of view that it adapts to anatomic changes. If the small bowel moves in or not after a day, then you can modify it on the fly daily to achieve ablative uh, dose, meaning you can still give a much higher dose. For example, these are images on different days and you can see that the bowel moves in different areas and the CT guided radiation is based on a single CT. Then the ablation therapy here can be much larger because every day is adapt and change. And this is done by one of my colleagues, Michael Chuang, uh, who is our uh, uh, radiation oncologist and he has a lot of experience on this. Um, then it, it does uh, allow for a significant dose escalation and the MRI LINAC is 50 um, gray and on five doses and five fractions, biologic equivalent to 100 gray. Then again, this is the same thing. And uh, uh, on 40 patients, they just published this at ASCO2, uh, a different, uh, an updated series, but on 40 patients at one year local control of 88% and one year overall survival 60% with a very low toxicity of 2.9%. Again, unresectable cancers, these are things that only a few years ago, we were not doing, at least I was not exposed to any of this three years ago. It's pretty good results. And uh, uh, the next thing, and with this I'm gonna conclude, is we are participating in a multi-institutional um, uh, multi trial where they are, we're giving targeted chemotherapy delivered directly to the pancreas cancer. And basically this is given, and I'll show you several of this, with a catheter that's put on the artery um, on this splenic artery that goes to the area of the tumor and you have a balloon proximally and distal and then you give the chemotherapy. The goal is not to give chemotherapy, not, we're not looking for a chemotherapeutic agent to go into the vessels, but to go to, go to the tumor by diffusion. Then you, you put a balloon proximally and distal to the, to, the, uh, to the tumor. If this is the tumor, you pass the catheter, you put a balloon distally insufflated approximately insufflated, and then you start passing through the center part chemotherapy into the vessel and increase the pressure. And as you're doing contrast material here, as well as the chemotherapy starts to, to pass and transfuse into this area of the tumor once you have narrowed the space um, and done by contrast. And you can narrow the space on that. This is done by our interventional radiologist, Dr. Ripal Gandhi is the one, and these are the pressures. Basically, once you inflate the two balloons, if you put pressure up to 45, that's 45 millimeters of mercury, that's when it starts to diffuse the chemotherapy. And again, this is an example on a patient that had a tumor on the hepatic, common hepatic artery. You can see the balloons, and the, the, the balloons are done. And this is the SMA, and this is the common hepatic artery. These are the two balloons that are given here, the two Renovo balloons, and then you can, you can do that. Um, that ab ablation. Um, this is a reduction on the patient's tumor size. It's not a lot, but uh, it reduced from 2.8 to 2.3, from 3.3 to 2.5 on a single, uh, on a single um, uh, application. And this is the overall survival on chemotherapy and Renovo catheter on, uh, versus historical controls. And this is 66.7% versus, and this is uh, 12 patients um, uh, versus um, versus 12% uh, for just systemic intravenous gemcitabine uh, plus radiotherapy. Of course, this is a little old because this was um, historical control. This doesn't talk about fulferinox or gemabraxin, but it gives an idea that this may work. These are unresectable patients. And um, they, the, again, this is the Kaplan overall survival. We're now participating on this tiger pack randomized control trial that basically it's trying to get 298 patients. We are one of the centers that's doing that. And this, I'm not gonna bore you. I'm gonna skip it again because I know we were running a little late. Um, then to summarize what's new in pancreas cancer, technical advances as several of the lectures today have shown that have come a long way and will continue improving. I fully agree with the excellent presentation of Dr. Martini that says the operation is safer. 
Um, the overall survival in pancreatic cancer, however, is not being improved by surgery. Uh, I agree well, again with Dr. Martini that we do a very good oncologic operation, but not even the best open oncologic op operation has shown any advantage on survival. We have not done any dent. Then to me, neoadjuvant therapy, new diagnostic modalities for earlier detection, and new treatment modalities is where the money is going to be and is going to allow us to still continue doing our surgery, but having our patients not die as they die today. And again, multi-specialty approach and strong collaboration are a must. I'm very fortunate that I work on an institution that that's the rule, but if you are in community practice and you're doing um, this type of things, you need to form a strong group and not just of surgeons. We have concentrated about surgeons for a long time. Then we went about the, having a team that's the, 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 the team the, the salvage technique, the, the, the teams that are, are the ones that, that help us from, from our complications. But also we now need to concentrate and develop a team with interventional radiologists, interventional oncologists, and our own oncologists that just dedicate to pancreatic cancer. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, well, thanks for that uh, excellent talk, uh, Dr. Asman, as always. Um, so now we're going to uh, have all the uh, people, uh, all the speakers turn their camera on. Uh, and a special thanks to Dr. Aloya, who um, really outlined uh, such a great strategy to get so much knowledge uh, from all of our different speakers today. Uh, so Dr. Alcide and I are going to start with some of the Q&A and then go on to some of our own personal questions. Um, and so I would like to direct uh, this first uh, question from Dr. Artur Singhi, uh, distinguished pathologist from University of Pittsburgh um, that had uh, written that gut paper that Dr. Um, Dilhoff had discussed. And uh, I'd like to direct this to Dr. Asbin, uh, where he says to the speakers, what is the MIS data regarding enucleation procedures and performance? Since you had this somewhat incorporated to the uh, Miami guidelines, I figured you'd be a good person to take a stab at this one. Enucleation procedures on malignancies or enucleation procedures on, on, uh, on neuroendocrine tumors and non-malignant le uh, lesions? I think both then, given that the, the question just was that, that that I gave you, but I think you could answer it. Um, yeah, I mean, en enucleation on malignancies, to my knowledge, and, and I will welcome any of the other comments, of course, are, are, are not done. I mean, I don't think that that's appropriate um, uh, to do enucleations in, a malign in an adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, basically, because we need to do an oncologic procedure with, um, with an associated lymphadenectomy. Uh, however, enucleation is a very well-established procedure for neuroendocrine tumors, particularly insulinomas. Um, and uh, some people does enucleations for IPMNs. I initially thought that that was um, uh, not appropriate, but when I have a large IPMN in the head that is exophytic, I have done enucleation. And it's very interesting because you can get to the actual connecting duct if it is a side branch and put a couple of clips on it. And my results so far on a less than 10 cases have been very good. Mm -hmm. um, then the enucleation is feasible. Uh, the MIS approach has um, at least, the, the, in, to my knowledge, in retrospective data, uh, similar results that the open approach and in some hands even better because of the magnification. Having said that, we don't have really level one data and I don't think we will ever have it because there's such a variety of, of lesions that do enucleation that it's gonna be very difficult to get uh, uh, enough uh, patients, especially um, trying to decide what would be the end goal. Excellent, thank you. Thank, thank you for that answer, Dr. Asbin. You know, the next question, and, and uh, uh, Matt, good to see you. Thanks for logging in on your, uh, on your travels. Appreciate you joining us. Uh, I have a kind of a two-part question for you, and then we'll see what other panelists this. The first one, uh, is a question from the from the audience, which is in comparison to open procedures, is it more important to pathologically evaluate surgical mi margins intraoperatively for MIS? And this is, as you know, specifically kind of a thing because if you remove the specimen, you gotta you know have your extraction port, then you gotta close your extraction port, and so many people will just leave it in there and do the reconstruction and then just you know you know send it without frozens. Uh, so we'd love to know your thoughts on that, and then I have a second one for you once you answer that, please. Yeah, I mean the the data on checking margins uh, for for 
for pancreas cancer is ambiguous. There are some people that believe it's important. There are some people who believe that it isn't. I guess my answer would be, you know, we strongly believe you should do the same operation open as minimally invasive. And the, the question implies that there could be a difference. And if you're doing the operation minimally invasively in a way where there's a difference, I would argue you're not doing the right operation. So um, I don't think it's any more important, but whether it's important is on. That's a good answer. John, what do you do robotically? Do you remove the specimen and go back in? So early on, I was extracting the specimen mid midway through, um, I'd say maybe in the first four or five years of doing robotic uh, Whipple's um, and then I just stopped doing that and I now send margins selectively. And uh, so, for example, if I'm worried about a neck margin, I'll take an extra uh, sample of the neck. If I'm doing an uncinent margin, like if, if there's an area of margin that I'm worried about, then I will send that. If it's a, you know, probably the one you can't do that with is like the vascular groove margin. and. I think I'm, a, I'm much more of a pragmatist now with frozens. And, you know, if I'm doing a Whipple and, and I'm worried about the groove margin, then I ask myself, well, am I going to open this patient and do a segmental vein resection? Because for me, I still do, a, if I'm going to do an interposition graft for a Whipple, vein, that's going to be open. And, it's, it's, and I'm and I going to ask myself, am I going to do that in that patient? So is the frozen going to change what I'm going to do? Is, is a question that I ask myself now. I don't just send, when I first started, I would just send frozens because that's what you do. You send frozens on everything, right? And I don't find that helpful as Dr. Katz was alluding to. You're probably not doing the right operation if you're doing that. Thank you. Lisa? Yeah, uh, thank you. So um, this uh, next question I'd like to, um, uh, to designate for Dr. Wei, um, since you're sort of like a mid-level faculty um, and you've had you know, uh, some uh, new uh, adoption of the MIS Whipple. Uh, this question is for junior faculty, who, while referrals are building and volumes are still growing, uh, does the panel recommend focusing on doing uh, cases open or would you recommend integrating robotics early on? And I know John touched on this uh, a little bit in his talk, uh, particularly if already comfortable with advanced laparoscopy and run of the mill robotic cases. So um, Alice, if you'd like to start us out with that and get, then we could get some comments from the other audience members. You know, what I think is incredibly important is that you have to have enough volume to sustain the practice, whether it's open or minimally invasive. I, don't, I think that uh, for young faculty, you have, you know, I, we, I started a robotic uh, laparoscopic liver program in Toronto as well when I first came on staff. And I said, I'm not going to start it until I do a year of cases under my belt of open cases. So I, I think you have to be quite familiar with the open cases as well. If you're a junior attending, what I would suggest is that you pair with one of your senior colleagues who can provide the insight into the open experience to help uh, that he or she can help you with that experience. Uh, but I would focus, I, I think you should focus on being very comfortable, very safe, very familiar with all the steps open before you start tackling it minimally invasively. And then you should use that time to build the other components of your minimally invasive program, the elements that will be important. One of the cases that was the best for us, I'll give you an example. Like for me, um, when we were building the program, is like a robotic pump very challenging case, doesn't have the same anatomic issues as a, as a robot Whipple, but that's a good base case. Um, while you, you know, work on your open Whipples, you can work on your robotic pumps, robotic livers, um, and, and grow your practice that way. And I'd, I actually look for, or what do others think? Yeah, and uh, Dr. Dilhoff, I'd like you to answer this as well, since you were a junior uh, faculty when you started doing robotics and did pair with a uh, more uh, experienced surgeon. Can you let us know about your experience and what your guys' thoughts were? Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Wei in that um, I, for us, I, and I, I think um, for us that graduated uh, in a time that we had um, a fair amount of robotic skills, um, I think it might change as, you know, a lot of younger people have a lot more robotic skills than what we um, trained with. But I think even if you have a lot of robotic skills, as an early attending, your um, open skills develop dramatically in the first couple of years, even when you're superbly trained. So I still agree with um, 
getting a really um, strong foundation under your belts and then pairing with, I, I think the, the benefit of pairing with an, uh, another attending is that your volumes just increase, right? So if you're doing both your uh, volume of Whipples, like you can just get a, a much higher um, volume and get through that learning curve in a more efficient way. And so um, I completely, I think that we should really work hard at getting a, a good foundation and then, and then moving forward. You know, this, this, um, this, thank you so much, Dr. Dahl, for that answer. I would say, you know, what's interesting is that the literature is becoming very much filled with um, do we need open to do laparoscopic not, or robotic? And not, not for HPB, but a, that question is being asked for hernias, for example, in the sense that, you know, a lot of hernias are being do, done robotically and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, bariatrics, like many people are not doing open bariatric surgery and they're just going directly to MIS. And, and so it's it's a little bit of a, uh, but it sounds like we're all agreeing that for HPB it's different because of all the, especially in oncology that that open is very open experience is incredibly important. Uh, the the next question I can ask for for Dr. Wei if I if I may, and that's a uh, a uh, um, a question from from uh, your your older neck of the woods in Canada, which is with regards to justifying uh, uh, embarking on MIS Whipple program specifically to hospitals or department leadership beyond length of stay and, and uh, generic uh, um, morbidity indicators, there's a there dearth of evidence on patient-centered outcomes. Uh, can you speak on that and specifically on data with respect to patient-centered outcomes? Um, so, so in Canada, there are 25 robots in the entire country of 35 million people. I think in my own hospital, I have half of those, and uh, and and certainly in New York, there's more than that. So, you know, the, the challenge with proving that uh, that robotics has individual level outcome success is very challenging. I actually think it's the wrong measurement. I think there there are uh, innovations where the uh, where the right the right place to measure the right scale is not at the individual patient level. And so, for example, I do what, you know, one of the things I think is that minimally invasive surgery may not help every single patient go home substantially earlier, but may help a population of patients go home a little bit earlier. When I was a policymaker, we used to see that with a robotic, with a minimally invasive colorectal surgery, that if, if the entire population of the, the cases goes home a day earlier, that opens up a day extra of ORs that can be used for other cases and other opportunity costs. So I think the way to build a business case for it is not probably at the individual patient level, but the population level and at the ability to scale um, and offer and access minimally invasive surgery to an entire population of patients. Excellent. Yeah, we, you know, um, hopefully I have a paper in surgical endoscopy on patient recorded out, uh, reported outcomes that hopefully uh, will be accepted and coming out soon. There is not a ton in the literature um, specific to MIS uh, or versus open uh, for patient-centered outcomes. There are some, you know, uh, studies on metastatic pancreas cancer and some other things. So to try and find certain measurements um, in terms of these out, uh, outcome measures, it, it's, uh, it's very brief. There have been a couple studies on Fitbits, uh, one out from Denver and one from um, the Netherlands, uh, not showing great difference in some of those outcomes in, in MIS versus open. Um, and I think most of those were laparoscopic um, compared to open. Uh, but anyway, let's move on to another question here. And then uh, this one uh, was uh, semi-answered by Dr. Alcide, but I want to also open it up and have Dr. Martini discuss, you know, how would you recommend balancing building your team, growing your own learning curve, and getting general surgery residents or fellows time on the console? We don't have dedicated mid-level providers that might provide consistency from month to month. Um, so, uh, how do you do this at your center, and how do you recommend others um, do this? Well, yeah, that's a good question, and I think first of all, um, just like what happened in the late '90s and early 2000s, you know, it, surgeons had to go through the laparoscopic learning curve as attendings, and so. I remember as a resident that I had attendings who could just simply couldn't operate laparoscopically and, and, and other attendings that were very talented, like Joe Amaral, who was my mentor. Um, the surgeons who are going to be doing this need to get through their own learning curve as quickly as possible in order for them to transfer skills and training to the trainee, whether that's a resident or a fellow. 
but I will say that having a dual console facilitates the transference of those skills because I can sit on a console with a resident or a fellow, whatever, depending on the case, and I can give them portions of the case and I can safely Im and immediately stop that procedure and take it back and fix whatever problem is created. So I think, yeah, you know, having a dual console and being getting the attendings through their learning curve as quickly as possible so that we can then allow transfers of skills. And that's gonna take five to 10 years, okay? It's not gonna be overnight. And, and there will be an unpleasant part. Fortunately, you know, at our institution, we have two of my attendings uh, that do not do robotics that all of their Whipples are open. So, you know, the fellows and residents get a lot of open experience when they come to my room, they get to do some robotics that's appropriate for their, their level of training. But there's gonna be, there has to be this phase that we go through of, of training. And um, we struggle with it. We don't do it well because why? Because the acute care surgeons at our institution don't do robotics. So that means like 80% of the cholecystectomies and hernias are done either open or lap, mostly lap, but, you know, that's the problem. I'd like to also um, have uh, Dr. Katz comment on this. One thing, and, and John and I, you know, sort of always agree to disagree that, uh, you know, we have kind of a, a, a dual surgeon, you know, assistant approach where the trainees either at the console uh, and the attendings at the bedside or vice versa. And so when I was watching um, the video you showed, uh, Matt, you know, where uh, he pulled the vessel loops around the vein, you know, and outside the body, I'm like, that's what my sucker does <laughs> during the case. So I guess one uh, question for you, uh, Matt, is, you know, how did, you, uh, how is this approach in terms of who's at the body, you know, in terms of um, uh, who's at the console and the fellows and uh, doing this with two attendings versus a, a, a single attending? How is that sort of decision making at, at MD Anderson? No, I think it's case by case. I will say the group um, does make every effort to give uh, fellows uh, time at the console, and and um, but but as as you know, everyone's saying it's a, it's definitely a struggle, and you know particularly as the faculty are are kind of ascending the learning curve, it's uh, you know it's impossible certainly to to guarantee that a fellow will do um, you know the lion's share of any case. But I think you know with enough um, quantity and enough, you know, diversity of experience, like, like John mentioned, um, you know, the fellows, the fellows end up getting a good experience, but certainly I, you know, we anticipate that as things, um, as, uh, as, uh, as everybody's experience grows, then the, then the, the fellows time at the console will, will grow as well. But we, we have established already. I mean, I think, you know, Acoma and, uh, Trancow have, Put a great deal of thought and effort uh, in part, large part, I think, working with you, in fact, uh, to, um, to, to uh, try to ensure that the fellows get as, uh, as comprehensive an, a, an experience as possible. Thank you, Matt. Well, we'll uh, we want to be respectful of people's time. So we'll ask one last brief question. And uh, Dr. Asbin, I'll ask you this question. And it's a little bit more of a theoretical question, but it comes up quite often. If you have a a, you know, a well-trained HPV surgeon, but doesn't do MIS and they come up to you and say, I want to, I want to get into this. I mean, I have the support of my, my uh, chair and I, we have the patients, but uh, should I do this laparoscopic or robotic? Should, which, which, which pathway should I follow to learn how to do this at this day and age? Which one would you recommend and why? You're, you're muted. You're muted. You wanted to be. You wanted me to be muted for this one. <laughs> um, I think we all are going to end doing robotics. Um, I obviously have a personal opinion. I mean, contrary to a lot of people believes, I started doing robotics in the early two thousands, and I did around thirty to forty cases robotically, not Whipples, but a variety of other cases. And then I realized that my laparoscopic skills were being were becoming stagnant. And I decided, um, and, and also I didn't see a huge advantage at that time. Then uh, I feel that we all are going to do laparoscopic, uh, we're gonna do robotic, no question about it. Um, the question is, where do you work? I mean, I disagree with Dr. Martini that um, the acute care center are do, not doing robotic, uh, uh, robotic gallbladders and that's bad. 
I mean, if, if we talk about the cost to United States to do a robotic cholecystectomy, if everybody does it, now I do, I do, I'm purposely saying that, but I know, John, what you refer to. It's in terms of training the, the, the residents. And on that regard, yes, it's bad, but we shouldn't send the message, you know, the, that then uh, in general. Then um, I, I agree with Dr. Martini, with Dr. Hogg, uh, the best way uh, uh, to learn is the right way. And if you want to do laparoscopic or uh, robotically, um, you can. You, you just need to make sure number one that you're committed to it, and that you don't cut corners. Um, the, the robot is a great tool; it's fantastic. We're all going to be doing robotically, but I see no harm in trying to learn laparoscopically. In fact, you know yourself, and then Dr. Al Saidi, in Latin America, the Chileans that have developed the simulation in laparoscopic, and you are very familiar with, they're incredible technical surgeons. And if you put them later in robots or not, and they're gonna be good. And why not to develop your skills to the best of your ability? Thank you for that, Dr. Husband, wonderfully said. And with that, we will end. I wanna recognize Dr. John Marks, who's uh, the chair of uh, the Oncology Committee for SAGES, and thanks for joining us. And I'll give the last word to Dr. Aloya, but I wouldn't be a, a program chair if I don't mention that uh, in exactly two months, Sages will be at Vegas. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Asbin, as uh, the, uh, the past president, and I will very excited to see everyone there. It's going to be in person, and we already have almost 800 uh, accepted uh, speakers. So I look forward to seeing you all there. And with that, uh, Tom, thank you. But before that, I'm sorry, Adnan, please talk about the HPV program in, in Vegas, because this is a particular year. Now, there, there's there's a significant presence. I mean, we basically have two rooms every single day and we have a full uh, and two courses. One of them is a is a full day liver course. So very excited to see people join us. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Asman. It, it was our honor to have an immediate past president among us. Um, congratulations to Dr. Hogg and Dr. Al Sede for leading, you know, really a state of the art panel. Um, to our speakers, we're, we're indebted. Those were incredible talks. This is going to be enduring material that I think we're going to look back on over and over again. Um, it was incredible. Um, we uh, thank you all for participating. I'd like to thank again the assembled leadership of each of the multiple, I think it's five or six societies that approved this program, collaborated on um, the diverse panel and um, showed true, true leadership and uh, bipartisanship, let's say, in these times to get together and produce this. Um, I think we might pop up the, the slide one time again, if it's possible. Catherine to give everybody the opportunity to sign up for our future sessions in advance. Otherwise, you'll probably get it by email or Twitter or Facebook or the multiple channels that we send it out. But uh, a month from now, the, the same uh, moderating panel will convene the liver session and um, it's going to be a high bar to meet um, after this session and the others that were led by Dr. Strong and Dr. Marks. But We'll keep on track and uh, and continue throughout the fall and into 2022 with this uh, format. So thank you all very much. Have a, a safe and a wonderful night. Uh, Tom, before before we leave, though, I just want to thank you and John for having done a tremendous job with this initiative. Truly, it's it's superb to have a webinar with so many um, the incredible sessions as well as. Uh, having the collaboration of the multiple societies, as you have said, as a past president, immediate past president, I thank you and John for all the work you guys have done. Yeah, and Vivian Strong. We're, we're a three-part team and Vivian and, um, and uh, just tremendous teamwork. So thank you, Horacio, for those comments. We really appreciate it. Good. Thank you all. Have a good night. Bye, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. Catherine, thank you. Excellent you. job. Catherine, thank you, Tom. Horacio, it's good to see you. Good to see you, man. I'll see you really? soon. Yes. Yes. All right. Everyone, I learned a lot. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Thank Mary. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it, man. Bye. Bye.